Hello and welcome to Encore. Coming up in today's show, Barack Obama named it his book of the year. Fates and Furies tells a seemingly simple tale of man and wife with a double perspective that reveals the hidden depths of a romantic partnership. It's a subversive take on marriage and modern life. As the book's released here in France, Lauren Groff is in the studio to tell us more. Lauren Groff, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Your latest book, Fates and Furies, is about a couple, a marriage, and it's told from two perspectives. First, in the voice or from the point of view of the man, Lotto, and then secondly, from the point of view of Mathilde, his wife. There's also an omniscient voice written in brackets, and who are they and what do they have access to? Uh, I would like the reader to come to that decision herself, but um, it's very clear in my mind who that uh, bracketed voice is. But uh, what I wanted to do in that in that um, bracket is actually sort of show time in multiple levels. Uh, we have Lotto and Matilde's time, which is you know granular human time. And then we have this greater time that sort of swoops in and out like a hawk. So. Mm, well, you certainly get the impression that things are being seen from different perspectives, surfaces, and inside. It's very uh, it's very rich. Now, you've openly said that you're ambivalent about the idea of marriage. Why is that? Well, I have to also say that I am married and I've been with my husband since 1999. um, So I I just don't like a lot of the cultural baggage that there still is in marriage and a lot of the the expectations there are for women in particular within the structure of marriage. I mean, I think there are a lot of um, residual misogynistic elements in marriage as it is right now. Uh, but, you know, that said, I I have found a lot of stability and a lot of happiness in my own marriage. So it's obviously a choice that everyone needs to make for her, herself or himself. Um, but, yeah, I think it's just, you know, I don't know if we need it anymore as a society. Um, now, speaking of marriage, there's a point in the book where the character Mathilde says, you can never really be sure. There's no such thing as sure. Um, I think she's talking about this idea of committing her life to somebody else. And many writers have talked about the impossibility of knowing another. Mm-hmm. How much would you say that's true? I think it's massively true. And But I actually think that's one of the beauties of a, a union like this. I mean, I think that... Um, as long as you have autonomy and as long as you are able to have your own space, right, um, within within this larger unit, I think you're going to be fine. Um, but, it, but I think it's primarily about, you know, knowing the other person enough to ask questions about what's going on um, at every moment in, you know, the, the relationship. So, yeah. I'm just curious, what do you think your characters, Mathilde and Lotto, would, would say to that? Do you think they believe it's possible to know another perfectly? No, I think they both know um, because they both have a lot of uh, baggage and secrets that you can't know someone else perfectly. I think Lotto believes that he does know his his wife and I think Mathilde knows that she does not. So um, she's much smarter than he is in a lot of ways. Oh, okay. Now, there's a point in the novel as well when Mathilde says that books fail her. She finds them hollow in that reading is too predictable. It's not helping her. Do you, do you believe that, that sometimes literature can't save us? I, so, so I'm so ambivalent about that, too, because I'm a writer. So obviously I believe that it's of utmost importance. And I, th- I think that there's this incredible William Carlos Williams poem called Asphodel, the Greeny Flower, where he talks about um, poetry has never saved someone's life, but men die every day for lack of what is inside poetry. So I do think that um, to art uh, helps us know how to live. Um, it can't you know, save your life if you have a heart attack. Um, but I think it's, it's for me, it's absolutely necessary. And it's absolutely necessary to talk call into question a lot of the the privileges and a lot of the structures that we live under. Now, there is a reference to France in the book. I won't give anything away, but Mathilde has a link to France and French culture, including her name suggests it. Why did you want to weave that into the novel? Well, I, I love France. I mean, I, I lived here for uh, nine months in Nantes uh, between high school and college. And here's this is where I became a writer in, in very real ways. I thought I was a poet. And then I came here and was isolated from my own language um, and started reading novels. You know, there used to be a, a five franc uh, bookstore that I would go into and take down Emile Zola, Victor Hugo, and, and all the other writers here. And then I, I realized that I actually truly love narrative. Um, so I, it felt really important. 
important that this book that's very much about narratives and the narratives that we buy into also have something, my own personal um, stake in it. Um, and my own personal stake happens to be French. Staying with books and reading and moving to a literary initiative now, courtesy of Ivory Coast's chief librarian, who's been trying to get local women to read more. Hair salons are a popular meeting place in the country, and she's decided to turn them into impromptu libraries. Crammed onto the shelves between shampoos and hair extensions, books on loan from the National Library are now available for perusal. Luke Trego has more. In Ivory Coast, hair salons have long been far more than a simple place to get spruced up, for women at least. They're a means to catch up with community gossip and connect with neighbours, but now you'll find much more than cutting and styling within. Reading in the salon, it lets me pass the time and not waste it on useless things. <laughs> it's the brainchild of Ivory Coast's chief librarian, who's been working since 2012 to get books to people in a country where literacy among women runs at 33%. Now she's taking advantage of the existence of such a social nexus to reach the image-conscious Ivorian women within. <laughs> For this reason, they can spend at least an hour and a half at a hairdressing salon. So the library decided to bring the books to women, to a place where they regularly spend their time. 1,750 books are now at the disposal of nearly two dozen of these mini libraries, which get 50 books each in regular rotations. Moreover, those salons have even been lending books to other hairdressers working outdoors and even simple passers-by. There are others who just come to read the books. They sit down and when they finish, they drop the books and leave. I can say that since the mini library came, my salon has been working really well. The increased business is certainly one advantage for getting involved with the scheme. Another is the possibility for children, too, to wait for their mothers and read books of their own. An investment not just in their own future, but Ivory Coast's as well. Lauren, as a writer, I'm sure you'd be the first to champion the power of reading and literature, but I believe that you recently burned a manuscript of it's, yours. Is I it, did. Why is that? Oh, you know, I had been working on it for 12, year, 12 years, and I was sort of haunted by this uh, character. But then I realized that not every book that you need to write urgently needs to be read urgently. So um, I'm happy. I burned it in order to say goodbye and to start something new. I think it's good. And what is your next project? What are you moving on I to? I can't tell you. Oh, goodness, <laughs> the, the secrecy will kill us. I know. Now, there's an idea in your recent novel that there's this conflict between the artistic life, the creative life, and the personal, the domestic fear that one person almost has to provide support and scaffolding for the other to be able to create. Do you believe there's really not room for two creatives in a, in a good relationship? I think there's definitely room in certain relationships. Um, in mine, no, there is not. Um, but I, you know, I think it's actually incredibly difficult to, to be a creator and to ask what that means of the people around you. Uh, and it, it just, I mean, for instance, I was home um, with my children and my husband for only 100 nights last year out of 365. Um, and so the burden of parenting falls on my husband. Um, and I think it's absolutely possible, but I think that a lot of times just people walk into expected social roles. Um, and uh, it, it's good to question those, I think, throughout the course of the, the relationship, yeah. Now, Fates and Furies, this novel, was named by Barack Obama as his book of 2015. That's high praise indeed, and I hear that you were very pleased about that. Yes. That is quite amazing. Not only is he the president of the United States, but he's also a published author as well. Now, we're coming to the end of the Obama era. What do you think his legacy will be? Oh, I, I don't know. I love him so much. Um, I think that he probably will be disappointed that he hasn't pushed through all of the, the progressive ideas that he wanted to push through. But we, he was the right president at the right time. Um, he united the country in, in a tremendous way. And I only hope that we can um, someday return to the America that he is giving us right now. Um, I, d I don't know. I think that I, I, he's going to inspire many, many people um, to believe that they can also have power in our country. Um, brown, uh, small children, you know, I, I think that he's just an incredible example. And looking forward in the years to come, the Trump presidency is likely to be one that's very, very different. Mm -hmm. 
What do you think that will herald artistically? Oof. Um, well, I know that most of my artistic friends are on fire right now because um, right now we're at a moment of absolute um, resistance and we have to resist. And it, I think it's the, the job of the artist to push really hard against what Trump stands for because what he stands for is robbing the country of our patrimony and giving it to his friends. Um, so I think the artists are, are going to write and make amazing works of art in the in the future um, in resistance to Trump. I think mm -hmm. that, that's what that means. And as platforms and art forms change, I'm thinking here about the digital sphere. There's a moment in Fates and Fury where Mathilde says all of our futures are going to be in the internet. How do you think the digital sphere is going to feed into artistic creation as the years Oh, it's going to be fascinating to watch. I have no idea, really. I mean, I think that for a long time, people thought that, for instance, books were going to go directly to the digital sphere. But it, it turns out that people really love paper, you know, dead trees. It, 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 there's a smell there. There's a sensory sort of feel to them. So it's it's hard to know. Um, I think it uh, there's going to be a backlash. Um, and I think that uh, people are, are going to find ways to use the internet to connect. Uh, that's what literature is, right? I mean, it's, it's a way to connect to other human beings. Lauren Groff, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure, today. thank you. Now we're finishing with a new exhibition opening this week. It tells the story of a book that photojournalist Robert Kappa called A Bible for Photographers. Henri Cartier-Bresson's The Defining Moment was published in 1952. Since then, it's gone on to define a pioneering approach to photography, and the book itself has become an iconic object with its front cover designed by Matisse. That shows on at the Cartier-Bresson Foundation here in Paris. Remember to check out our website, and you can also keep up with France 24 on social media channels. There's more news coming up after this.